what I'm doing. Okay. I think it's all right now. Okay, so I'm going to talk about SAS and CSS preprocessing. Um, stop me at any point if you have questions. I really don't know what everyone's like familiarity level is with it. I'm kind of just getting started myself, but I'm at the point where every time I start a new site, I want to put everything into SAS and I convert to that, so I'm at least using it as kind of the default and a basic feature set. And I definitely think it's worth, like, if you're kind of on the fence of whether or not CSS preprocessors are worth using, I definitely think they're a valuable addition to your, your whole toolkit. But uh, we'll, we'll see about that later. Um, so what is a CSS preprocessor? It just takes an intermediary language and compiles it down to CSS. Um, like, same exact idea as CoffeeScript, for instance, which is an intermediary language for JavaScript. Um, and that allows you to have access to additional sort of syntactic sugar on top of CSS. And you can get some other handy features. Um, so the basics are like this would be a snippet of uh, SAS code where you have a variable declaration up top. The variable is used later um, down in the, the A color line. You have a nested selector for a hover. And then you have a function that will take a couple parameters and spit an output. So all of those things that you don't really have in CSS yet. And it gets compiled down into this. It spits out valid CSS on the other end. So it's just A, and then it takes your variable and, and puts the value in there. Um, and then a hover, that line gets created from the nested selector. And a new color is created from that darken function. And we'll see all that like in more detail later, but that's the, the basics of it. So it's very analogous to sort of traditional compilers, though I don't think compiler is really the right term for this, um, because C code on its own doesn't really do anything, right? It has to be converted into an executable binary that the machine can actually read. So this is the same thing. SAS on its own doesn't do anything, but you convert it into CSS that a browser can then render. So browsers never render SAS themselves. It's always the the sort of spit out um, CSS on the end that gets used. Why would you use a CSS preprocessor? Um, they provide you with lots of nice code organization um, and modularization tools that don't really exist in the, the underlying target language. Um, you can get a lot more consistency by things like variables, like we're all probably convinced that variables are a good idea, right? <laughs> um, Maintainability is just the huge thing, like that's the impact of the above. And so those, those are the main things that I really like about it because I'm kind of like a, a neat freak about my code. I want it to be organized and, and like just sane so that I can look at it later and understand. And it really, really helps when you start using some of the organizational features that are available. Um, but you can also do things like build cross-browser abstractions so you don't have to worry so much about writing CSS that works in IE or particular problems like Android WebKit or whatever. Um, you can oftentimes get other uh, things you want to be doing anyways for free. So like minif minification and concatenation are best practices for web performance and the SAS compiler can just do that for you and you don't have to worry about it um, being a, a different step in your build tool. Um, and it even, like, this is kind of an interesting one to me, it can catch um, vanilla CSS syntax errors because since it's a language that gets processed through a compiler, uh, errors, syntax errors are caught at compile time. And otherwise, like, there is no warning with CSS. You forget a semicolon somewhere in the middle of your file and you upload it and then your entire site's theme breaks because halfway through the browser gets thrown off and it ignores half of your rules. You actually get those sorts of errors caught ahead of time because SAS is only going to understand valid SAS and it's only going to spit out valid CSS. Um, so that's, that's kind of a cool benefit that um, isn't necessarily obvious. Uh, why wouldn't you use a CSS preprocessor? They don't actually like make your sites prettier. They don't necessarily make your CSS better. Um, that you know, doesn't just happen magically. It would be awesome if it did, but no. Um, they can add complexity to your build and deploy processes, particularly as you start to m mix and match tools that are coming from different languages and different styles. Um, it is possible to abuse features and to make the code even worse. So. 
like the nesting we saw above. One thing a lot of people warn against is having overly nested code so that you're like 10 layers deep and you're not even, you're working on a selector and you don't even really know what it is because it's so deeply nested. Um, and then, I mean, but that can be avoided with just um, a little bit of restraint. And then you still need to know valid CSS. So it's really something you have to do after you know CSS and build on top of it. You can't just learn SAS directly because SAS itself is, is composed of mostly like regular CSS properties and rules. So you still have to know things like text decoration is the thing that you do for underlining or whatever. So all of that knowledge is still required. Um, so which one should you use? And I just have a list of a few of the proper ones here. Um, this this is about SAS. Yeah. Ask. No, ask. So if, if, go, go back up a little bit to the yeah. uh, minification thing. Um, that touches on a really interesting question, um, which I've seen in different organizations deal with differently, which is that suddenly your CSS is like a compilable language mm -hmm. instead of just CSS that you check in. Yeah. So since it is that, should you compile your CSS and check that in to your version control, mm -hmm. or should you say every developer and the build system is responsible for compiling their own, just like any other code yeah. on the system? Because if you're going to do the minification at the SAS level, then it implies that you're having, you have to compile it and check that minified version in. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then it kind of makes debugging harder. Well, not necessarily, because you can always redo it on the fly, I guess. But I don't know, do you, do you have um, opinions about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a, like a really good question, and it does vary a little bit, but this is basically how I see it. Um, for most projects, you probably don't want to check the CSS in. You know, that is like checking in your C binary or something. Like it doesn't, it's not really necessary and it, it's not needed in any way. Um, and every commit that you do is going to have this like 99% rewritten CSS file because one character in this minified file changed, you know, it, it just kind of noises up the commit history unnecessarily. Um, but on the other hand, you know, a lot of people do use like GitHub repos as ultimately a source of like library code that gets pulled elsewhere. So like something like Bootstrap, where they're writing it in a um, preprocessor language, but then they're using even GitHub. I mean, probably most people download Bootstrap from elsewhere, but some people do go to the GitHub and download like bootstrap.min.css, mm. and you want people to be able to do that. So in, in those instances, maybe you do want to have like a, a release system that includes them. It's especially, I guess, for projects that don't necessarily have like a 1.0 release, 1.1 release. Like, if you want to grab the pure CSS at various commit points, then I could see some value to having mm -hmm. having it in there. I haven't looked into this, but on the and one of the neat things you can do to improve site performance is if you have some really small images, bite size wise. Yes. You can compile them into data URLs mm -hmm. that, are, that live in the CSS. Yeah. Um, and it essentially becomes like a bunch of binary looking garbage in your CSS, which mm -hmm. is great for, for performance because you don't have to make more requests for all these small images. But then you get a larger CSS document which slows down the first load of that site page. Right. Um, although then it's cached for subsequent pages. So in, within like in a compressor like say Django compressor, you can set a, um, uh, a tolerance. You can say if the image is smaller than 2K, make it into data URL inside of oh, the, cool. the CSS. Yeah. Otherwise, just keep handling it as an external image. So yeah. like, if you did it at the SAS level, would you have that level of control? So um, short answer is yes, because there are extensions and libraries that build on top of SAS that do that same thing, actually. So there's, there's like a SAS function where it's like two data URI and you provide it with a file path, and it goes out and grabs that file during the compilation phase and converts it to one of those terrible looking base64 blobs and inserts it in there. So yeah, you can absolutely have that right in your, in your SAS. Mm -hmm. That bit about the logic related to file size is really cool, and I don't think that's covered, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, you, you can do those sorts of things. Yeah. And that's all actually um, Compass.
I think. Um, so Compass has some cool tools around like creating image sprites automatically too. Like you can give it a folder and it will automatically make a sprite out of it, a folder of images mm. on the fly and things like that. Um, so those are usually extensions on top of SAS, but that possibility is totally within the realm. Yeah. Um, so just briefly covering some of the different options. Um, SAS is probably the most mature and well-known of the preprocessor frameworks. It was originally written in Ruby, so it is a gem that you would install. Um, it fits really well because of that with like the Ruby web stacks like Ruby on Rails um, or Jekyll, the uh, static site generator. Um, and it's, it's often included by default in some of those environments. I, Rails, I'm pretty sure, ships with SAS. Um, it comes in a couple flavors, one of which uh, is like SCSS, Sassy CSS, and it's a strict superset of, SA of CSS, rather. So you can just take your CSS file, change the file ending, and then you have SAS. Like, you, you have valid SCSS. And because of that, that version is a lot more popular because it's, it's really easy to bootstrap yourself and start using a feature or two and slowly convert your, your document into using more of the advanced functionality. There's also a more white space friendly version that like you can tell the Ruby nerds made, right? It's, it totally goes in that direction, um, which I think was the original idea around SAS, um, but it's, it's um, less used, I would say. I don't see a whole lot of code written like that. Um, and then portions of SAS have recently been rewritten into a cross-platform C library meaning that you don't necessarily have to use Ruby uh, to use it anymore. So there are wrappers for Python and for Node. Um, not all of those features from the Ruby gem are in the C library yet, though. So there are some weird inconsistencies, which, which isn't fun to deal with. Um, the, and that's maybe another situation where you need to have a discussion around, should we be checking in the CSS? If like not everybody has the same build tool chain, you, you might have problems. Um, and there's a nice uh, website here about SAS compatibility that points out the problems with different ones. The pace of development of the Ruby gem, I think, is always going to be ahead of the C library. So this may may always be a problem. I don't I don't see the C ever catching up. Um, but because it's like available in everything, you can do a whole there's a whole bunch of different ways that it's available to you. So you can install it as a gem. Uh, SAS. There's a command line tool that's just a binary compiled from the C um, that's uh, available in Homebrew, SAS C, um, and it's lightning fast, as, as you might imagine. Um, and uh, there are wrappers for JavaScript with Node SAS and uh, Python with PyLib SAS. Um, Less is probably the second most popular one. It's written in, in Node and JavaScript, which means it integrates really well with a lot of the JavaScript build stacks like Grunt and Gulp that are pretty popular. Um, it's one of the kind of nice things about having a, a build tool written in JavaScript is that they actually have it written in client-side JavaScript too. So you can like basically include a less compiler.js script and then your like styles.less file on on a page and it will compile them to CSS live right in the client and that's a really nice development tool so you just have an HTML document and you're you're going away and editing not something you'd want to do in production but um, I'm it if the same thing exists for SAS I'm I'm not sure that it's like as as simple and straightforward um, also notable that Bootstrap is was originally developed in less um, and you can use Bootstrap as a library. So instead of just having like the full framework in there, you can use its like components in less as little classes and mix-ins and build on top of it. Um, so that's that's a kind of interesting advantage. And uh, it is worth noting though that like people have already ported Bootstrap to SAS as well. So maybe not a big deal. I don't know a whole lot about the other ones. Stylus is another popular one. Um, it's also written in Node. Uh, it was written by this guy, TJ Holloway Chuck, who's like pretty smart, but I, I don't really know anything about it. <laughs> it seems legit. <laughs> yeah, it seems legit. Who's really smart, so it's probably good at something. I mean, it's, it's around there for a reason. Um, so you don't know what Stylus' advantages are? No, I, I've, the only ones I've ever used are Less and SAS, so I've never used Stylus. Would, would it be true that like Less 
used to be more popular and since is now more popular? I actually... I don't know. I mean, I only have my perception, but to me it was like SAS was always the most popular one. And then when Bootstrap kind of came out and started to gain momentum, less sort of started catching up a little bit, but never did completely. Mm. Um, I see a lot of like smart CSS developers using less, but I, I couldn't tell you why they're picking it over mm -hmm. SAS. Um, Wasn't less written to um, compile CSS or to work with vanilla CSS, and then SCSS was written in response to that. So it was like SAS and then less, and then that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah, because the I think the first version of SAS was that like white space one, and it was because like the Rubyists were like this language is ugly, let's make a pretty one, and then less. Yeah, it sounds like you know working the other way around, taking yeah. CSS as a starter and then improving right. it. So. In some ways, those are like kind of differences that play out. Um, I think some of the advantages of SAS too, though, is because it, it didn't bind itself to CSS originally. It really does work pretty well as like a language of its own with classes and mm -hmm. import statements. And I've never used them, but it has like higher level data structures in it too. It has like arrays and objects, sort of. I'm mm -hmm. I'm not entirely clear on it. I have have not don't have the brain power to start thinking of my CSS in terms of arrays and objects. <laughs> um, myth is worth mentioning just because it's kind of like, I felt like at a point it was going to be the new hotness, and it's kind of like uh, polyfilled CSS, where it it's very much looks like CSS, but then it uses these cutting edge features, which will eventually be supported everywhere, and then falls back on... Um, like your your vanilla hacky throw in throw in everything that makes it work CSS, um, but I've I've never used it, and it's another um, node thing, another npm install. So I didn't actually say which one you should use, um, but we kind of talked about it. I think SAS is is probably the best. Um, it's very common, as we've already discussed. Uh, kind of, there's a lot of tools already built around SAS. Like, there's plugins for every development tool. There are ports to different ports of major libraries to different languages and stuff. Um, the, it has the most answers on Stack Overflow, and it's, it has lots of great documentation. It's just it has a you know pretty good um, head start and community around it. Um, Compass is really great. A lot of people cite Compass as the single reason why you should use. Um, SAS and Compass is like a framework. I won't get into too much, but that's like kind of the end is where I say, hey, Compass is great. Um, and uh, other things like, so Bootstrap is in less, but Foundation is in SAS. Foundation, equally great CSS framework. Um, Bourbon is another CSS framework. Um, or we could use less, um, you know. I, I don't, I'm not like super opinionated, but I think using one or the other is great. Well, I, I think this is a great question. Um, I, I love the idea of us having a standard that's mm -hmm. campus wide. It feels like SAS is kind of already most prevalent. I mean, is anybody using less at all? I have been just because we're using Bootstrap so much. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, and just because that's like the default, the way it ships. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the portal project checks out the SASified version of Bootstrap. And ah. then then has the compass config file right. in it. Um, I mean, I'm not wedded into it necessarily. It's yeah, just, I mean, I guess that only affects the the new ETS site, which is in mm -hmm. less bootstrap. Otherwise, I'm not too mm -hmm. tied to it. I'm probably gonna try to use Bootstrap in like everything I do, though, too. Um, so. If we ever redesign the library site, that's going to use Bootstrap. Just because also some of these third-party apps that we subscribe to use Bootstrap and are customizable at the UI level. So I'm going to already have to learn the classes and conventions. So, I mean, that's a, a semi-argument in Les's favor. Mm -hmm. It does, I mean, how you're, the SAS port of it works fine, right? Yeah, I would yeah. Imagine. As far as I'm concerned, Bootstrap comes in two flavors now. Yeah. So just because you're using Bootstrap is not necessarily going to be for less. Mm -hmm. Just because it's kind of, I don't know. Um, so if you use less, you don't get Compass, though. Correct. And so what would you lose out if you didn't, get, you didn't have Compass? 
Um, some of the really cool high-level tools like compiling your own sprite from a folder or automatically creating data URIs. Like, that's the sort of thing that I just don't know if it's possible unless. And maybe what I should do is, is like, after this, do a little bit of research and find out, is there anything even comparable? Um, because, like, SAS is great, but Compass goes to a really high level of... Um, basically how it works is it's, it's not written in SAS, it's written in Ruby. It interacts with the file system and stuff. It does, like, all of this extra stuff because it, Compass itself uses SAS as a library and extends it. So um, it's, it does some really complicated, amazing things. Anyways, I, I, uh, I don't think we need to agree on a standard now, but yeah, it's, it's worth, worth bringing up. So CSS is just the worst. It is, <laughs> it is the worst language ever, if it's the language. Um, it's, it's mainly because of the cascade, which like seems like a great idea when you first read about it, but then you realize that it's just this like long string of contradictory statements, and every time you want to change something, you add another contradiction onto the end. Um, and it gets, it gets really hard to figure out, um, you know, where your different rules are interacting with each other because you don't have many of these organizational constructs. Um, so not having like a real import statement really, really hurts. You can do at import URL in a, in a style sheet, right, and break your style sheets up. But that's so massively inefficient over HTTP that nobody really does it. It's like a very common piece of performance advice is don't ever use at import. Um, it's really easy because of that like series of contradictions to back yourself into a corner and start having to resort to like bang important or ID selectors or just lots of, of really bad practice in order to get things to look the way you want, um, which really hurts maintainability again. Um, and cross browser compatibility actually hasn't been like so bad. I don't know, it used to be so much worse, but that's that's also an issue. Like some some CSS that you have to write in these crazy hacks like zoom star colon one or whatever to get IE to behave and it's just silly. Um, so SAS, SAS isn't gonna like make CSS great and fun to work with, but it makes it bearable. Um, real quickly, I'm gonna like touch on each of these, so I'm just gonna read them off now, but it has import statements you can actually use, um, it has selector nesting, it has variables. Um, just between those three, I think that alone is, is worth using it, even if it didn't really do much CSS stuff, all that organizational things are cool. Um, it has a lot of built-in functions, particularly the color ones are super great and really handy, um, light and dark and, and lots, lots more. Um, it can do like basic math and calculations. Um, mix-ins are kind of like functions, so we'll see those later and those are handy. Uh, larger blocks of code, basically. Um, it'll catch errors at compile time, which I already talked about, and then um, it'll build out your minified CSS as well. Um, I'm not like super expert is the disclaimer below that. Uh, if you do want to see like some of this in action, the Aquila theme, I've been slowly working on converting it into SAS. It's actually kind of interesting, like maybe if you go back to the, the first commit or so, where it was just some CSS written by uh, work study students, and it's a 18,000 line CSS file um, with like hundreds and hundreds of important statements in there. Um, and one of the first things I did was I started to think about, okay, you know, this, these styles relate to this page, these styles are, are typography, whatever, that's not actually one of them. But I, I started breaking it up and organ th organizing things a little bit um, and so you can look later on in the history where suddenly things are a bit more broken out and organized. Um, and, and some of those features are used. And I think the, the overall code weight is greatly reduced because A, I started minifying, and B, I reduced a lot of redundancy um, that they had. What are you touching to? I'm 18,002. Um, I don't know. In the main, I think I have the project open. OK, so the main file is this customer one, which still isn't great. Um, but you can see, like, I'm breaking things out into, so the first three statements are, this is the first three lines of, like, every SAS file I write is, like, some general variables, my colors, and some general mix-ins that I'm going to use throughout. Um, and so it's down to 326, which is 
totally not representative because those last are a bunch of import statements yeah. that import so a whole bunch more. But um, I remember it was 30k. Um, okay, so here's like these are all the files, and then how much does a large CSS file affect performance? Uh, because I I know how it yeah. run before I know how it runs now. That's right. like how much of that is because of this 18,000 lines? CSS. Probably imperceptibly little. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there are so many other problems going on. Um, but it definitely helps. Um, so I want to say, you know, probably cut it in half or something, at least by, by minifying. Yeah. And um, so, oh, there it is right there. Fish shell is amazing. So it's down to 30K. It was probably a lot bigger before. I could go back in the history and look at it. And you can see a lot of these files are not very big either. You know, my variables is like tiny. Um, that customer one is by far the biggest. And it's all the components where I haven't figured out where to put them yet. I'm like, I don't know what this does. So I have to leave it in the main file. It has to be named, well, I could name it main, but uh, the software makes us name it customer when we upload it. So um, import statements work because Something that you name with an underscore at the front just gets scooped up and inserted right into the source code of the file you import it. It's not like a like a require or import in like a sophisticated programming language. It's more like C language import where it just grabs code and slaps it in. Um, but that works for CSS. So I have my at import underscore layout. Um, you still have to have the semicolon uh, in, in SCSS, but the file extension isn't necessary. And then I have some more code down below, and that gets compiled to, it takes those two rules that were in the other one, inserts them in there, and then the one that was already there is at the bottom still. So it just compiles those out. And you can see how I was using that in action, right? It's just to have a whole bunch of import statements. I think the ideal main SAS file is just a long string of imports, right? Everything belongs in some other module. Um, Nesting I find really, really useful because a lot of the times you're organizing things in sort of like chunks. Like this is my header code. This is my, this is gonna be some widget. This will be another widget. Um, and so what you can do is start a selector, add some rules, and then within that have another selector. And what it compiles down to is it'll take the first one and put whatever rules are in it. The next one inherits the parent of that as, as like the beginning of its selector and, and whatever rules are down there. Um, so that's just super, super handy organizationally. Um, and there's another little handy tip there that was actually in some of the very first code on this, this uh, page. If you want to not just use the, the prior selector as a parent, but to like modify it with a pseudo class like hover or first child or add on like another class, like a multi-class selector, um, you can do and. So in this one, I have a couple rules on my paragraph, and I'm saying and p.leader is going to be font weight bold, and when you hover over p.leader, it's going to have a white background. So that'll compile down to three rules. There'll be one for p, there'll be one for p.leader, and there'll be one p.leader hover. In particular for hover styles, right, that always makes sense because you can finally just keep them in the same block, in the same set of curly braces. You can always have your so, hover so how states. Is the and dot leader different than just dot leader? What's the difference? Um, okay, so this P and then no and, there's a space between. So the selector is a child. Yes. So I should have written out the compiled versions. Yep. Instead of the nested one element nested inside of another. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. with the and, it's p dot leader, no space in between. So yeah. it's paragraphs with a class of leader as opposed to anything with a class of leader that has a parent that's a paragraph. Yes. Um, yeah. So that can be really handy. Anything that's like modifiable states to like dot off, dot on, those sorts of things that like Bootstrap does all over the place, you know? Um, really handy with the and nested selector. Oh, I did say what it compiles to. I should have just kept scrolling. Yeah, so p.leader, p.leader hover. Um, and then I have a warning about over nesting. Um, 
it's something that people rant about in like poorly written SAS code. Personally, like I don't even worry about it, and I think the increase in organization is is totally worth it. But a lot of people say don't don't get like three levels deep, four levels deep. Um, variables really handy. Uh, you can you can store anything in them. So like font stacks, put a put a whole list of fonts in a variable. Um, store colors. Colors are are super useful. Um, right, so I can store all my like uh, brand colors, like CCA orange is, is stored right in there. Um, then numbers, like percentages, pixels, etc. And then when you reference them later, it's kind of like in PHP or Perl. You just have like the dollar sign sigil at the front, and that'll evaluate to the value of the variable. Um, so what I end up doing is I usually have a bunch of uh, files that are all just like variables. Um, and then that makes it very easy to, when somebody's like, hey, this red is like a little too glaring or something, I'll go into my colors file and, and change it. And all the different places that red is used will, will be changed and will be consistent. Um, and just, just other things too, like your spacing and, and typography and all that can be abstracted out into files that basically just reiterate variables. Yeah. Um, functions are pretty cool. Uh, the, the color ones are just wonderful. So here's like every link style ever pretty much. You have that, um, if it's a link, we're going to make it this blue color. When people hover over it or, or click it, um, we want to lighten it a little bit. So what this does is it, it's a function. It takes two parameters. First one a color, second one a percentage. Um, and it will just lighten the color that much. And then there's also darken that, you know, does the exact same thing, but in the other direction. Um, so, like, this may not seem, like, super great, but the, the increase in consistency and organization by just having one color statement, right? Like, I just have that one color blue, and then I darken it by so much, and I lighten it by so much, can be so huge. I, I really like being able to do stuff like that throughout. Um, so it's really useful with hover styles. It's really useful with just like slight variations you have throughout, rather than having like a billion different colors on a, on a page. Everything is kind of like derivative of just a handful. Neat um, technique is to have your designer come up with, you know, here's our palette. We're using the six mm -hmm. colors, that's all. And then you define them with you know logical names that will hopefully survive across redesign. So right. instead of like blue, you're saying you know margin color or header color or whatever. And they're defined at the top. And then any transformations on them are using like light and dark, and so they're pure variations of those. Not you mm -hmm. pulling up a color picker and saying that looks similar. You know, and yeah. the color suit. For sure, I always try to do that too. Where I'm like, no, I'm not going to call this red. I'm going to call it like error. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this color success, but then I have such trouble later, like using the colors. I'm like, wait a minute, but I want this to be yellow. I forget, like, <laughs> and, you know, it's yeah, so. Yeah, called warning with any like. Why do they call that warning? Something yeah, right. right here. Was it error or was it danger? You know, like. Um, so I I usually end up with a little clue in there about what the color kind of looks like, but that's that's a really good point. Like just having the palette and then having names that are meaningful outside of color scheme, yeah. Yeah, and you can even be really generic. You call them you know, prim primary text, secondary text, mm -hmm. and, you know, primary background and secondary background. Is really yeah, generic, so. I like that idea, primary, secondary, yeah. Or like highlighted, call out, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are really many, many, many functions. I think the color ones are the easiest to to demonstrate as, as really great. So there are things like uh, pull out the red or the green or the blue from a particular color, mix colors together, um, but then opacity function, sure. Um, there are also just like all sorts of, of other handy functions built in here. So I don't know if you can see my scroll bar, but this is a really long page and there's lots of, of useful things. I'm not sure where you would use like two uppercase, two lowercase and stuff, but just a whole bunch of different um, functions avail available to you in there. And you can see that like a lot of these maybe are more for your like library code. They're for your bootstraps where it, it has to do a lot of things, a lot of processing for each um, 
mix in or, or rule, but definitely some, some interesting things in there and really useful. Um, calculations are pretty handy. So uh, before calculations, we had a lot of CSS code like this, right? Where it was like, how did I get this number? I have to put the calculation into a comment beside it, right? And then sure enough, somebody updates like, uh, you know, a, a value somewhere else and you have to go redo the calculation and then re reinsert it in there. And hopefully you left that comment because if you didn't, now you have no idea how that number is derived. So this is like a little typical um, two column type thing where you want, um, you want in your basic 960 layout one to be 600 pixels and on the left and the other to be 300 pixels and on the right and you're going to have like a little 60 pixel slide in between them, but it's it's fluid. So it, this calculates those out in percentage. Um, and native CSS calc is actually like doing this. So um, calc is in everything but IE10 plus, which is, oh, Safari is kind of a limiter there. Safari oh, 6 and up. Can I use, you're calling me, can I use site directly from Alfred? Yeah, this I is an Alfred so. plugin for can that I use. Awesome. It's, it's yeah. pretty handy. Alfred? Alfred. Yeah, it's like a, like an app launcher, like um, Quicksilver or Spotlight is the one that yeah. comes built in. Yeah. Super handy. Um, yeah, so I'm um, al almost usable, um, Calc is, but uh, it's those are also the sorts of things where I could see, like, if you have lots and lots of Calc statements in there, that's actually a lot of client-side processing that you could all just do beforehand in your compilation step. Um, so... Probably at some point it'll make sense to be compiling this stuff anyways. Um, this is that written out in SAS, right? So you just write the calculation right in there. You just say, okay, 600 pixels divided by 960 pixels times 100%. Um, it can't do mix and match units. So that's something to think about, right? Like the pixels cancel out and then you um, multiply by a percent so you end up with a percent. Um, when I first started using it, I was like, I'm finally going to be able to add M's and pixels together. But no, that's not a thing. You can't do that. Um, I don't know, maybe someday. I bet there's like a compass function that does that, where it, it somehow knows what the M's are and, and converts them. Um, Mix-ins and extensions are super useful for, like, I like to think of them mostly as multi-line variables. They just spit out really big chunks of code. So pretty much every site needs some kind of clear fix hack to deal with floats and things slipping out of their parents, right? Um, so this is a, a mix-in here where you say at mix-in, and then it kind of, it looks like a function, right? You write it out, you have your body in between curly braces, and you have um, parens for, for your parameters, which we'll see later. And then you just put whatever you want to be produced at that point in the code. So it's like everything in the body is like your return statement and is going to come out there. So I define this mix-in, and then I use it a couple times down here. I say this, this box is going to have my clear fix, and this other box is also going to have the clear fix. Um, and so what that compiles down to is then, then my boxes and my notepad boxes get all of that stuff spit out. Um, so that can be really nice in different, different areas. Uh, it's actually a bad example. I wrote this up and then I was like, well, I don't have time to think of a better one. Um, extend is probably uh, better because what extend does is it lets you, it's like object orientation for your classes where you can have a class and then have other classes inherit from it. So you can have clear fix, which is, is this thing. Um, so it's, it's basically that exact same class I did uh, that mixin I did above, except it's not a mixin, it's just an actual CSS class. And then down below, all I do is I say, okay, this box needs to inherit from Clearfix. This this notepad box needs to inherit from Clearfix, and then I can add whatever spe specific styles are needed onto each. Um, so that's another really powerful organizational feature. Um, mixins can accept parameters which really can reduce redundant code. So um, I don't know if mm, nah, it's not worth going back to the project history, but basically 
we used to have in that vault theme just like this big chunk of code repeated about a dozen different times for all of our different buttons that we had for our, our red button for cancel and our green button for success and stuff. And I started looking at them and I was like, the only thing that changes is the colors here. So this is, it's a mix-in that accepts a parameter, which is background color. So I have my variable dollar sign B, BG color in there, right? And all I do is in the body of the mix-in, I'll set the background to that, um, that parameter. And then elsewhere, I'll use that parameter and lighten it on hover. So I'm getting hover states in this button too. And with that, my, my button code is reduced to that initial declaration, and then all I do is just use different colors later, right? Like that's all the buttons are. You want them to look the same everywhere. So we have our default button, which is like a grayish thing, and I just pass gray into that. Then we have our, our cancel or danger button, whatever, um, which we call, which we just, you pass it the color red. Then you have your success button, you pass it the color green. And you get all that. So it's like a tenth the, the code size. Um, the stuff that gets spit out on the other end, obviously, is still a lot of CSS. But it, it helps. I would be writing that anyways. This way I can make it a little bit better. I guess probably more logically you would have a dot button that does most of this. And then use a mix ins just for pieces that change. But OK, um, other things. I'm pretty much done here. Um, it does have your standard uh, programming language constructs, so there are loops and there are conditionals in them. Um, I like almost never use that in my SAS code because it's just not the sort of thing that you need in CSS very often. Um, but I can think of situations where it'd come in handy. So defining a grid system, for instance, you might want a loop. So say you have a grid system where it's like, Column 1 takes up 10% width. Column 2 takes up 20% width. Column 3 takes up 30% width, etc. Rather than having like 10 um, CSS rules that all look exactly the same for that, you would just write one little loop that spits out all these classes. So that's, that's the sort of thing where a loop would make a lot of sense. I can see that if else is really being useful um, for responsive work. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if it the margin is 20% of the screen width on a desktop, on a phone, that would be too narrow, you might want it to be 30%, and that changes everything else. But that can't happen at compile time. Oh, true, well. So that's what, like, media queries have to do. Yeah. Media yeah. queries are your real client side, yeah. so if, if else yeah. thing. Um, and so that's the other reason why, like, I, I don't find myself using if else uh, in a compile language very much, but um, you can use it to make some of your mix-ins more diverse too. So like I was thinking about this, I was like, when would I use if else? What if with my button mix-in, I had a second parameter that was, do you want it to be large or small? And based on that, it could make it different sized, right? Like it would, it would make it, maybe, maybe it would be block versus inline block or something like that. So you could make your mix-ins really flexible and then just lean on them more with some kind of if-else stuff. I think the, the loops and the conditionals are more for like library code. Like if you're writing Bootstrap, you're using that a lot. But if you're just designing a site, you probably don't need it as much. Um, and it's definitely worth mentioning source maps too. Um, by default, the compiled output has this string of kind of like commented out gibberish in it. That's a source map that tells you what line of your, your SAS corresponds to what line of your CSS. So when you're debugging in the browser, you actually can tell what line of your source code is, is involved and go back and look at the specific one. Um, so that's pretty handy. And as far as I know, it's integrated with like all the good browser dev tools like Firefox and Chrome. I don't remember ever having to set something up. It just one day started happening. I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, so compass, which we've talked about quite a lot. Um, I think actually the right way to do things is to start with compass or some other big framework, not just to use raw SAS, because you can get so much built in 
that's really great. Um, so it kind of works like you would expect where you import a library and it has lots of predefined mix-ins that you can use. Um, so for instance, I import compass and then say include box sizing border box. That spits out all of the vendor prefixes I need. So like you, you basically, if you know compass pretty well, you never have to worry about vendor prefixes anymore because it'll just insert them in only the ones that make sense and only the ones for like modern browsers that you would be targeting anyways. So um, super handy. Lots of lots of predefined things. Um, Compass is also a gem. So you would install it and then you, you tell it to create a project. And what that'll do is scaffold out a, a directory structure, um, which is what I have here. So this is basically what it makes is it'll make a little config.ruby file um, and then you can you can compile stuff in your um, in your SAS directory and it will appear in your style sheets directly basically is how it works so I can do compass compass compile uh, dot this this directory dot um, and that should work okay yeah it did or um, compass watch dot and what that'll do is it'll continuously watch for changes and rebuild my file every time. Um, so watch is, is super handy. You don't want to be running compile over and over and over again. Um, and they, they have a really great installation docs actually too that's like worth showing. Because you can like, I would like to do this and blah 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 and it like, I think it like spits out exactly what you need to put into your terminal. Which is a pretty cool little website. Because I've got run server usually running in my main terminal. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing occasional SAS work, I'll just stop it and go compass compile. Yeah. If I'm doing a lot of CSS work that day, yeah. I'll have a second terminal open with just compass watch happening, so it's always recompiled in real time. And yep. then there's, um, there's a Chrome plugin called Live Reload yes. also that will tie in. So then you don't need either of them running. Um, it's Basically, the browser is now watching the file system for changes in doing this compile as needed. Yeah, and then it refreshes the page, so you don't have to do that, too. Yeah, it makes the whole development workflow really, really smooth. Um, that was, like, not, not much of a demo of Compass, but uh, it, it does a lot of different things. So all your, like, modern CSS, it will make um, cross-browser with fallbacks. Um, it has lots of great tools for balancing typography and font sizes, lots of utilities and crazy hacks that y you forget about. It has a built-in like CSS reset type thing. Um, it doesn't have a grid layout by default like something like Bootstrap would have, um, but there are definitely other libraries that use that and you can use them alongside Compass anyways. So um, Bourbon's uh, neat grid layout is, is one option. Um, and like there's millions of options is the thing and because you're using a preprocessor you can just say add import somebody else's grid up top so that's really really nice um, what does the actual running the compiler look like we kind of talked about this with compass but the actual command is just like sass um, you hyphen hyphen style and you tell it what style you want you can leave that out for just uh, large files, but I always say compress it, um, make it into tiny CSS. Well, so this, that's what you would do if you didn't have compass. That's how you. Um, really that's it. actually you probably still want to be doing that with compass. I don't think compass compiles by default, or um, I mean, makes it minified by default. Um, oh no, it doesn't. It doesn't. I didn't see the minification. Right, that's what compressed was. No, I just meant to do oh, this in general. Oh, this in general. then dash dash style. Yeah. Oh, style compressed. I see. Yeah, so the SAS has its own command line. It does. Yeah, it does. So this is, if you weren't using Compass, you would use SAS, and then it, it has a command line interface, which is, is pretty simple. It's At its simplest, it's just SAS input output. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, it does have a flag, too for sass hyphen hyphen compass and it imports all the compass libraries so you don't even need to put them in your code they're just there already um, so that's really handy you don't even need to worry about installing compass separately or like um, setting up 
running that compass create www, which scaffolds out a project structure, right? Using the, the command line flag basically makes it assume that that structure is already there. Um, and there are pretty good apps too, but I, I use the, com co uh, the command line mostly, but CodeKit is one that I hear a lot about. And then um, there's lots of ways to integrate it with your build tool. So um, Grunt, for instance, you would install Grunt and do all the stuff that you do. I'm not going to explain that. But um, basically, you install this Grunt contrib SAS plugin, and then you give a configuration object, objects in your Grunt file that just says what options you want, what files you want to build up. And then you'll have a, a grunt SAS command available to you that'll build it. Um, so that's pretty nice. And I mean, the advantage of grunt, if it's, if it's not um, evident, is like you're going to be doing lots of different things in your build process, right? Not just compiling SAS. So grunt will handle many of those and you'll say grunt build and it will minify a whole bunch of stuff and compile SAS and you know I don't know push it out to a dev server or something. So if you have a choice between using cool. grunt, I mean in your dev environment you've already got compass and compass compile and yeah. compass watch. Why not just have that be part of your build process? Why not just have the builder compass? Yeah, compile? you could. And that's um, that's what I do. I never run SAS, do whatever, or Compass, do whatever. I just do it all through Grunt. Um, you do? Yeah. Okay. And so I guess I don't get why, why is Grunt better than just running Compass? Um, it's better if you need to do multiple things. So, uh, like, if you're just compiling SAS and the rest of your site doesn't really have a, a deploy build, a build process, rather, um, it's not... It's not a big deal, and you don't need Grunt. But, uh, for instance, with our Vault theme, um, several things are going on in, in Grunt. So this is the Grunt file. It's just JavaScript that configures the, the build tool. And um, probably the easiest way to see it is I have this alias set up. So build, Grunt build runs these four tasks. So it deletes out all the stuff it made last time, it compiles SAS, it copies a bunch of images into place, and then it compresses that whole batch of stuff into a zip archive, which is what I ultimately need to upload to Vault. Mm. That's how I change the theme, is I go and upload a, a zip archive of, of assets. So like that's really tedious to do on my own. So just grunt build and, and do it over and over again. I guess if I was building, I don't know what I what I would have to be making for me to like just compile SAS because I'm probably going to want to do other things too. I'm probably going to want to minify JavaScript. I'm probably going to want to, um, I don't know, run a like JS hint or or something else. So just set up one tool to manage all the little tedious tasks. Um, I'll, uh, whoop, 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 where are we? Can Grunt do deploys, or is it always part of the larger deploy system? It, I'm sure it can. I'm sure there's some kind of, like, Grunt deploy plugin. Um, I don't know how well it would work or something, versus having an independent tool that does it better, you know? Right. Um, I'm sure it does, though. Uh, so some people are building deployment systems completely in Grunt. Yeah, I think that's be safe to say. Yeah, I mean that's just my preferred thing. I, I really like Node and NPM. I, it's certainly there are other build systems around them, but and um, I have a whole bunch of other things here. Uh, a colleague of mine actually wrote a really nice guide to like CSS preprocessors. Uh, Margaret Heller, so she's another librarian. Um, the SAS website is pretty decent, especially their basics page. It does a really good, concise job of giving examples of usage of the, the fundamental things. And there's a cold code school and a tree house and other things. Um, and I'll, I'll just email out this, um, this markdown document to everybody. Um, cool.
Any questions? How many people are using, you, you're using SAS, you're using less? I don't really do. You don't really do CSS stuff? Yeah. So this is really good. Yeah. Okay. I never, I just never do CSS. <laughs> That's because it's terrible. <laughs> it's not you, it's CSS. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I, I know that. But this is about the Yeah. In some ways, I think it's nice to just start out knowing, okay, I want to use SAS, because it can seem like a pain once you're already good at CSS to like, oh, now I have to do all this like command line stuff and install these things and configure this build tool. Um, but if you if you start from the mindset of like, well, I want to be able to have import and I want to have variables and I want to have loops and stuff, then you're like, you're already in a in a happy place. Um, right at the beginning, you talked about SAS introducing things that CSS doesn't have yet. Mm -hmm. What's on the horizon for CSS that might make SAS or less less relevant? Yeah, um, so it actually, like a lot of those, I don't know about nested selectors, but a lot of the primary things that I think of as the benefit are coming. Variables are coming, uh, like calc for calculations is coming. Um, the reason why you can't use import is a weakness in the HTTP standard, and HTTP2 is kind of going to destroy that. Like, it's, it's going to have um, multiple... Uh, what is it? Connection, connection multiplexing. So it's there's not going to be much of a need to do all this concatenation that we've always been having to having to do. Um, so in a way, yeah, like I think it's catching up an awful lot. Um, so the difficulty is knowing at what point our browser is going to catch up enough for you to use the great things that CSS has. I uh, just the other day was talking to somebody and was like. I don't want to learn CoffeeScript because JavaScript is about to get really good. Like, it's, it's, it has all these features that are going to make it nice. Um, and so it's kind of ironic that I, like, don't think that about CSS, but I do think that about JavaScript because it's, like, the yeah. exact same question, right? Well, it's funny. I mean, if CSS gains these features, then you're basically saying every client out there do interpretation in real time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, but you're the developer. You can run a compiler. <laughs> you can just do it, and then it's done for everybody. And the browsers don't have to you know, yeah. deal with all the variants out there. Yeah, that's true. And I wonder how much, how much do people have to lean on these more advanced features of CSS until they start to weigh down clients? You know, like if you do have a lot of calcs, and if I'm sure there are things coming like darken and lighten, like those color functions, that would be trivial to implement in CSS. So how much of that will it take until you start seeing articles about how it's recommended for developers to not use it and to compile it ahead of time, you know? Yeah. I don't know, that's a, that's a good question. Right now, you definitely have to minify and concatenate, and you might as well get some organization on the side. And yeah, it's, I think it's a, it's a good thing. So I've always used a third-party library for doing those things, mm -hmm. like Django Compressor, mm -hmm. um, which does a great job. And I sort of haven't ever brought those into the SAS process. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend it? Or... Um. I don't know, because I don't know anything about Django Compressor. I would say if it's working, probably no, don't worry about it. See, maybe that's that's another thing about why maybe like I turn towards Grunt and stuff, because I don't do a lot in these nice frameworks that have solved all these problems. Mm -hmm. And so Grunt kind of solves a lot of the same problems that like Ruby on Rails and Django yeah, are trying to with, with your asset pipelines and, and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. It's a little bit more tedious setting up, I would say, for sure, but I'd be curious under the hood, too, like, um, are, are frameworks like Django using, like, the PyLib SAS, or are they actually calling out to, like, a, a Ruby gem I, if I they're doing the SAS Ruby, thing? Ruby yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was just starting to experiment with um, the, the PyLib SAS the other day when I mm -hmm. realized that it's like, well, no, it's not just the compiler, it's all the imports and everything which I'm already dependent on that I'm using Bootstrap and it's mm -hmm. so I guess I'm kind of stuck. <laughs> I mean, 
I prefer yeah. to remove a Ruby dependency, mm -hmm. but in the end, stuff I think is well. Yeah. It could be done. It could be done, but yeah. I don't know if to do it. Right. That's what it comes down to. Cool. That was great, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really Oh, thanks for.